Welcome to the brand new podcast. It's called Week Things Break. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Jeremy Loper. And I'm Tom Barry. And you're going to find a lot of information here about strength and conditioning for not only professional athletes, but your everyday enthusiast as well. Tom, being our strength and conditioning guru here at Westside Barbell, I've brought him in for all the facts. I wouldn't say guru, but <laughs> de definitely guru in training under Louie. And hopefully I can bring some different aspect to this from a coaching point of view that some people, maybe it's that itch in the back of the head of like, I wonder, I wonder what they do to get ready. Whether you're training for the NFL Combine or you're just training at your local gym, I think you're going to find the content here on the podcast exactly what you've been looking for. In this podcast, you'll see us feature professional athletes, which, Tom, you've had a lot of access to high-level athletes, whether it's football, weightlifting, mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been pretty fortunate here at Westside. The, there's a constant rotation of high-level athletes, high-level coaches. As you said, we, we have abundance of NFL players, but also NFL coaches, which allows us to show you behind the scenes what a coach looks at when they're training an athlete and what they're looking for during in and out of season. I think one of the most important aspects, too, is it's not just physical training, but also mental training as well. Yeah, that's the great thing with the gym is it sets you up to create whatever environment you need. So you have introverts, you have extroverts, and that really dictates how you set up training. So, for example, we've had athletes who've got terrible social anxiety, which you can imagine yeah. if you're going out in front of 60, 70,000 people, that can be scary. Absolutely. And plus affect support performance. But in the gym, you get a group of 10 people around you and they're screaming and yelling, then going out onto the, the field becomes way easier, especially in MMA. When you have MMA athletes, I think the gym is way harder than fighting. You know you're doing the right job. Without a doubt. And we can also talk about things that might affect everyday people. Like when you're going to the gym and maybe you don't have that, the balls, if you want to say, to walk in the door. Yeah, yeah. And I think we can help give a checklist to make sure at least if you're checking these boxes in the gym, you're, you've are you got a good structure of how to train optimally. And the, the most important thing is we don't want you to get injured. We have a very, very low injury rate here. And we have hundreds, if not thousands of athletes come in and out every year. So I think we can give you our expertise in a very simple and direct manner. So with football season in full swing and we're just a week or two away from the actual Super Bowl, they've added an extra week to the NFL season. And with the playoffs, we saw an extra week. Do you think that these guys are undergoing a ton of extra strength and conditioning training going into this season uh, as opposed to others? I, I think this season has definitely been different with the whole environment, the way everything has changed. Um, we've seen a big pickup in players actually having private coaches, which I think is huge. It's hard for a strength and conditioning coach for a team because logistically it's a nightmare. So athletes going out getting their own coaches is huge, especially for injury mitigation and reduction. Um, I think by having that extra week right now coming so close to the Super Bowl, it's all in restoration. These guys are so gifted and so talented that there's not a lot more they can do other than try and make themselves as happy, or sorry, as um, healthy and as recovered as possible. Uh, so I think um, with those who are not, or they're out of the league, they're out of everything now, that's where their training really starts upping and I've noticed over the last three years that there's no off season, that these guys are really like hitting the ground running and go, how can we be the best athlete possible? And so what are some of the questions? Like when these high level coaches and athlete trainers come in and ask you, like, what, what are some of the common questions and things that they're looking for? One is how we assess an athlete. Everything starts with asking the right questions. Sure. If you ask the wrong questions, get the right answers, you think you're doing a great job but the likelihood of injury is pretty high. So we just go through our simple pre-testing, how we test athletes, what we look for in joint ranges of motion, how strong they are, um, where their hierarchy of training importance is. Mm. From a coaching perspective, that's what we talk with coaches the most, the most about. And if they identify, hey, we've got a huge um, hip issue with hip range of motion, hip strength, we're like, okay, here's a list of things we do. Here's what you can do 
And um, then that we just try to guide them and we analyze. We never criticize because every team has their own different red tape they have to go with. So sadly, being a strength coach in the NFL is a very hard logistical-based job. Private sector, super simple. Yeah. You give me one athlete, we can work with that. Right. Um, but when you've got a whole team and you've got way different personalities, you've got sports scientists screaming data yeah, at you, sure. you've got to do this. Then you've got your head coach wanting to do this. It's very unusual to have everyone on the same board. So from a private sector, we try to tell the athletes, coaches, or the athletes, hey, here's the hierarchy of importance. Let's go with that. Now, do the athletes bring in their own coaches or do they have to be subject to whatever team they're on to actually use those strength and conditioning coaches? It depends. Um, depends on the level of athlete and obviously the level of income they have. Some athletes who get into the league don't have a lot of expendable expenditure, I guess, at sure. the start. Um, some teams, their coaches are super on point and they send them out with stuff to do. Uh, but in the last three years, especially, most high-level athletes have their own trainer. And we talk with the trainer, we see what they're doing, we see if we can add to what they're doing or take away. And we just generally just try to guide them. We never try to overpower because we're, we're in more of a consulting role now, an educating role, rather than how we train our own athletes. Because personal, how you would train an athlete and how I would train an athlete is way different. Sure. Because your personalities and stuff like that. We all have the same core values, but how we get to the end goal is always different. So we just try to uh, get the feedback loops in, uh, in place to make sure they're getting data, make it better. Now, as far as injury and recovery goes, now that's so huge, whether you're talking about football, mixed martial arts, or rugby. What is it when an athlete is training back like Conor McGregor, who completely snapped his leg in his last fight? How would you personally like have an athlete like that build his way back? Would you start physically or do you start first with the mental confidence? Well, you have a team. That's the big thing is like you have to understand what the structure of the team is. And it all stems from the head coach and the athlete. So coming off something like that, I would 100% work with a therapist. And because they start from the inside out, we're very good at uh, building up uh, the muscular aspect, the conditioning aspect. But from the, the ligament, tendon development, the structure aspect, you need to work with a therapist. So we will work uh, hand in hand uh, trying to get out a, a game plan and set in some markers of... Uh, okay, you reach this level, we can move on to this. Sure. So everything is objective and data-driven. Uh, we get with the head coach, like, okay, what's the goal? Do we want to be back in one year? Want to be back in six months? <laughs> right, right. We've had it with NFL athletes, like, hey, if you can get me back in three to six months, I'll make 20 or $30 million. You're like, well, that's significant money. And that's big pressure, right? Yeah. And especially if the coach kind of knows deep down that they're not going to be back out on the field at yeah. 100%. And then when a, an athlete comes back, they have to pass physicals. And then you just don't want to get an athlete, like duct tape them back together, passes the physical, two games in, they're done. They're, yeah. Done so again. you have to like have certain goals and aspects. That's why working with a therapist, I'm pretty lucky. Like realistic goals though. Yeah, like, yeah. it has to be an objective. Sure. You can't just go, oh, I think. Like, no, you have to know. And that's why working with a very competent therapist. Uh, I've been working with John Quinn since I got here. Yeah. Very, very fortunate to work with someone like him. He's like a walking, talking human MRI. So <laughs> when I said in, I'm like, hey, John, I want to reach this goal with him physically. You're like, well, he's not going to be there. And then you got to work with a doctor and a surgeon. Yeah. You, you want to see the surgeon's report of how bad was the break, what they did to do it. Because all this factors in. So we try to give as much object, objective data, put it in a format, put it in a plan. And then that allows the athlete and head coach to look at it subjectively and make out a plan. Um, there's, we've had cases, we've got people back from severe ruptures in three to six months. We've had people that takes 12 months because people recover at a different rate. We work with, uh, Joe Madovich when it comes to hormones and nutrition, because everything plays a factor. Strength conditioning is just a cog in this whole machine. The therapist is there. The nutritionist is there. What they're eating, uh, sedentary lifestyle kills people. So if you've got a broken absolutely, leg, absolutely, absolutely. Been sitting in the house is not going to be good. So you got to make sure you have structure in their environment that they're always training. So, and you can't avoid, if you broke one leg, you have to train the other leg. It's very important. Um, and by doing that, you're not going to lose as much strength in the opposite leg because of the law of irradiation. Once you keep the body going, the sense of nervous system will, will help develop.
And I think this is exactly who we are. Weak things break. And when you're talking about physical therapists, I think it's so easy to dismiss. I uh, had my shoulder surgery a few years ago where I got a couple pins put in. I tore my bicep off my labrum uh, doing jujitsu and powerlifting. And, you know, all of which was my fault. But at the end of the day, when it was time to go and do the PT, why is it, you know, I'll blame myself. I'll put myself out there a little bit. Why is it folks like me, athletes, that we totally doubt the PT? Well, you have to understand that a physical therapist can't go to the extreme to tell you, hey, we'll have you back right. because they're afraid of lawsuits. Gotcha. In the private sector, we're a little bit more open because we can all sign waivers like, hey, you go get a doctor's advice if you want to have the be all and end all. But a PT is going to, have, they've got a certain way that they're taught and they've got a certain cadence that you have these milestones. And they're always going to err <clears throat> on a side of, not as aggressive as we would be. We're more aggressive because we're very confident and confident in what we do, but we set up checks and balances the whole way through. So if you don't pass, like a, it's A, B, C. If you get to D you just and it doesn't work, you can't pass it off. So we, we have these steps in place and we have these markers to where that's, it might take you three months, it might take you 12 months. It all depends on how your body recovers, reacts, and you have to be meticulous in everything you do. Yes, if yes. If your lifestyle, like stress plays a huge role, work plays a huge role. Um, that's why for athletes, sometimes it's easier to get them back in because they can devote 100%. But if you're an athlete with four kids and you have obligations, like you have to have family time and sometimes that can take from recovery. It might take another two weeks, but that's okay. We plan for this thing. But we tell you, here's a realistic outcome. And uh, at the end of the day, it's objective data and structure. That's what we yeah. bring to the table. I don't think people prepare for what it is mentally to be hurt. And I mean, like when I was down, I wasn't prepared for the feeling of loss that I had, like, you know, missing the sport, whether it was martial arts, whether it was uh, weightlifting here at Westside Barbell, but it was just the, maybe the camaraderie of the team as mm -hmm. well, just being there and being a part of the team. And all of a sudden you're benched and you have to figure not your physical recovery out on your own, but your mental. And one of the things that uh, that has been a blessing to me in the martial arts is learning Tai Chi and Qigong. Mm -hmm. And I got certified as an instructor and it was a huge part of my recovery because it, it's crazy. The, the brain will play so many tricks on you as you're sitting there and you're recovering and you wanna be back and you wanna be a part of everything that's happening. And you think you can, and your brain will tell you how many, you know, different lies that you can even think of, you know, like, yeah. it's insane. And I think that's how a lot of people get hurt. And if you can train yourself and, and find some sort of like peace within yourself and dealing with any situation that comes your way and you're able to turn that into a positive, I think that's a place where everybody wins. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a tightrope. So you can be very mentally strong and the vast majority of athletes are tremendously headstrong. Like they get injured, they want me back tomorrow. How do I do it? What's next? What do I've got to do? That's where the checks and balances come in place. Because if you give them uh, objective goals along the way, they can tick the boxes. So like, oh, I'm making progress. Yeah. Um, and it helps us restrict. They want to go 100%. If the end goal is like, I got to lift a 100 pound dumbbell. They're like, give me a fucking 100 pound dumbbell. Can I do it? And you're like, well, no, we have to go. Like, hey, let's start at a, at a number and build up to that. So that's, uh, and the mentality aspect, we can do a certain amount in the gym and it helps, but usually most top athletes have phenomenal resources and just mental strength and routines that they do before any game or any training. So it's our job is to understand what that routine is. Don't hinder it. Just give it a little bit of direction and back to checks and balances. When you have none of this in place, that's how you recover fast but you get injured a day later. So our goal is to where we want to build you back way stronger than you've ever been. That's why I've always respected Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods is one of these guys that played at such a high level. He knows that. He knows what it's like to win at that high level. But at the same time, you don't see him rushing back to the game of golf to compete, especially after the car accident. We saw him come back in Orlando, play with his son, and that was phenomenal. And, you know, he downplayed how how much of uh, his game that he actually got back. I mean, I think when everybody saw him play in Orlando, people were shocked. Mm -hmm. 
and they wanted more. But it's interesting that he knows, he knows himself and to your point, he knows exactly what his body's capable of and how long, more importantly, his body's capable of that. Our goal as a coach is to educate you as much as possible. No one knows your body better or feels it better than you. So if we give you as much knowledge as you want and you can handle, the feedback mechanism is insane. Because you can tell us things more uh, articulately and more in a direct manner to help us train you better. Um, the golf is a, an insane sport. And I shouldn't say insane, but it's a very different sport in that you could physically be a beast, but mentally, if you're off, you're off. There's, there's no brute strengthing in no, that. It's, it's just, <laughs> I can it's, attest to that. Yeah. It's one of those sports to where um, you have there's a oh, combination of things happening, but one is mental clarity, and mental ease. Sure. So a lot of them have routines, and that's why I find it one of the most intriguing sports to be a strength coach for working with top level golfers. Is these these are athletes. Like some of these guys are phenomenal athletes, but they could do every pre and post test, crush it, go out in the golf course, and then something is off. And we can't affect that. That's, sure. the, that's the strange thing about that sport. We can prepare them. We can try to put in plan A, plan B, plan C to keep them focused. But uh, that's why I, I think like golf is one of one of those sports that I truly enjoy the challenge of that aspect. Yeah. Um, and that's why huge credit to Tiger Woods. Huge credit to any golfer who comes back and uh, mentally is able to go okay through. Because I've seen golfers play with low back injuries, like zero hip range of motion, like none, and crush it. And it's all mental. So eventually the body will give out and that's when surgeries happen. And hopefully we can, as a coach, we can catch this in time and develop it. But that's the one sport where there is no brute force. It's a, uh, you can't go, I'm just going to tough myself <laughs> out. It just doesn't work that way. How many times have I sat in the golf cart or been at the clubhouse and you look around at all the other guys and you just think like, yeah, I got this. I mean, like if it comes to physical prowess, I got this right now. And then you get on the course and that is not what you got. You got nothing, man. You got nothing unless you have the skill and you have to be, you have to, you have to put the reps in. Oh, look, I respect it so much because I'm terrible at it. Like <laughs> when you go to top golf, you're trying to get a ball into a crater. Right, right. They're trying to get ball into a tiny hole and I can't even hit a crater. And you're like, <laughs> like the, the hand eye coordination, understanding how the mud comes off the golf club. Again, from, a coach and a, someone who likes data, the amount of data they have to go through is is just insane. And the amount of coaching feedback you have, club heads, like all this stuff was just so intriguing because you can make them too strong and it might throw off their club head speed or you can make them too fast. Like there's all these things that everything has to come as one. And that's why the conjugate method style of training helps with that because every week you've got this constant feedback of adjustment. Absolutely. So, and we work with, like, that's, that's why we stick and obviously endorse that. that Would you say training. biofeedback is one of the most important? Everything. Every bit of feedback from an athlete, from uh, sports science, from the, the coach, the swing coach. I think try to bypass the athlete, not to bombard them with it, but as a strength coach, I want to take, I'm a glutton. I'll take as much data as you'll give me, and then I'll try to separate the wheat from the chaff and take, okay, this is how we correspond training with his uh just say sport specific training and then their game and we try to say oh here's a correlation and at the start it's very broad but then we narrow it down to each athlete and we have all these correlations we know that if all these line up you have a very significant chance of crushing it and then like working with some sports psychologists has been very interesting uh I, sometimes i don't agree at all what they're doing but again that's their profession i know enough to be dangerous so but i need to know enough to engage in a conversation and then some athletes just don't need it. They, they're yeah, grown. and also like psychology too, it's almost like a different uh, strength training. You have to train specific for the athlete because naturally some athletes are gonna come in with a ton of confidence and others, yeah. maybe that seems like that on the outside, but maybe that's what they need help with the most. Yeah, and then youthful exuberance. You got young kids coming up and they, they just don't care. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna murder this <laughs> because they haven't been through totally, the, the yes. experience. Yes. And then the other side, back to golf, because we've been in that realm, is that the amount of outside the course you have to do. They have to do, uh, just say, um, advertisements. They have to do uh, interviews. They have to do the pro am. Yes. They have to do all these things that you have to factor in. Then they got to train sometime because the golf season is insane. Yeah, without so you, a doubt. You have to keep on top of this. So it's a, 
for some it's a logistical nightmare for us it was just that challenge that john and myself like we put a lot of effort into it and we we thoroughly enjoy working in that realm because there's so much going on so there's no time off there's no like oh i can relax like okay how do we peak for this competition this yes. competition so that's why um it's one of those sports that we truly love working with i'm so glad that you said peaking for competition we're coming off the heels of ufc 272 and the main event with francis Ngannou and sarah gone for the world heavyweight championship was underwhelming mm -hmm. uh, from a skill level standpoint it was underwhelming you know we've seen people like dc we've seen people like stipe miocic from right up the road in cleveland at strong style compete at such a high level and such a high fight iq that to watch that fight to me was very disappointing and also kind of scary for those guys as you have john jones right around the corner just chomping at the bit to go to heavyweight how much work do you think that John Jones and his coaches put in to go to heavyweight? I mean, I've seen some pictures of him. He's looking to be about 255, 260, up from, I mean, I guess you could say maybe 220-ish, mm -hmm. you know, before his cut down to 205. How much actual time, and everyone is different, but how much actual time does it take to put on that much muscle? I can only speculate because I don't, it's all contextual based on the person. Um, the amount of time he's had, I think, is the most optimal time you you can because you want to be able to get used to the extra body weight um and then it's all about efficiency like you can be 250 260 pounds but if you're efficient and you have enough energy reserves then you can keep going for round after round and i guess it's up to your opponent to make you inefficient so you get tired uh and i caveat like that's not my realm that's just an observation but from a strength coach's perspective you want to put the muscle on in the right areas it's no good having 23 inch arms <laughs> like you you, you want to have like put it in the areas where he's going to need them and then you got to make sure you build up the mass build up the strength and build up the strength endurance in the given uh, aspect of it but um uh, mma is uh, another one of them interesting sports to where you've got people got different strengths you you're dealing with uh some very unique um attitudes and uh personalities sure um but it's it's uh it's one of those sports too to where on the hierarchy of things strength conditioning is in there but you're just a small cog because skill and mastery of your art you got a lot of arts to master that um that comes into play we just make sure that they're as strong as necessary and as in shape as necessary because working with wrestlers um nothing's gonna get you in better shape than wrestling we can try build up gpp but been a wrestler um we've seen and we've had guys who are studs here they get back in the mats they weren't uh doing stuff in tangent and it took them two weeks to get back into wrestling shape gotcha so there's there's multiple different aspects but i think because the cardio aspect of it, even with john jones putting on this much weight i mean how how much do you think that will affect his cardio it will affect it to a certain extent but they're raising it up alongside it and i'm, I'm i can only assume that they're getting the feedback from sport specific so as a strength coach i don't want you to be a gym hero if you make five pounds just say about record and we we just barely break it but you're crushing it yeah. as an athlete that's my goal i'm not trying to build a power lifter if you're not a power lifter i want to build an mma athlete which means there's a whole different realms we have to look at um so i'm talking to the head coaches i'm like hey uh, how's the endurance how's it feel talk to sparring partners hey is he feeling strong how is this going and this is over like a period of time you're getting all this data back in and uh then you just adjust uh, the training environment so your rest periods needs more conditioning sure um but it's it's again it's the age old thing it's dependent on the person but uh i think the time they have the they should have plenty of time to build up that cardio but when you're training an athlete especially for mma and just say francis nagano mm. that guy is very very strong so if his game plan is to make you inefficient so you tire or vice versa you have to program in just say and it's a very rough example if nagano has a 440 bench right so you know he can move 440 pounds well then you have to be able to tie in his body weight so to just say we've got nearly 700 pounds so we have to make sure that you know how to handle all this weight yes and he's going to put it on different angles different things so we're going to try to put you in different positions with different weights 
So you're strong enough to handle your own body weight, your opposition's body weight, and then your opposition's strength. So all these are factors as a strength coach that we try to cater in. Because you see some people who can do pull-ups, chin-ups all day long. They're so efficient at their own body weight. But then someone comes in with their body weight and their strength, and boom, they're gone in five minutes. Because they're not used to that, that ebb and flow of someone else's strength gotcha. and their body weight. So there's all these different variables to put in. And again, not everyone is as data specific as us, but working with uh, athletes here and like been mentored by Louis, like Louis is a human stat machine. You can just see he rattles stuff off. <laughs> but for us, it's so important. Uh, we try to factor in all these different variables. And most of the fighters, I think, that came through here would say that the sessions here were so intense and so hard that when they got to sparring or they got to fight, that was a lot more relaxing. And that's our goal. And that's just make- a lot. I mean, that's just, when you're getting punched in the face is easier than being at the gym. That's a that's a big statement. Yeah. Well, you see, when when they peak for a fight, like I remember, I I was, you got to think when I came to Westside, uh, like uh, I was indoctrinated by Louis Simmons and Matt Brown. Like <laughs> that, that's quite a combination of people. I've learned so much from Matt because Matt's got a uh, he's a very intelligent person, got a very unique aspect of how he looks at training. But the feedback I was getting was so important. And I learned so much. Like I learned from day one, you don't talk at an athlete. You don't talk down to them. Uh, if they're a professional athlete, they're going to do stuff regardless because it benefits them. Sure. That's their profession. But um, And like you were saying before, to your point of like uh, the athlete's income. Yep. You know, a lot of these guys, obviously, they came from absolutely nothing and they've become everything or they become something. Right. Yeah. So you have to almost get past the idea that they did train themselves at one point. So they do know uh, to a certain extent. So you have to kind of work around that ego a little bit. Yeah. Right. Well, you do. And then you have to understand they have to be somewhat selfish because they have to feed themselves. Like Westside's a very unique place in that we don't expect any monetary return. It cuts out that so we know we're both can be honest to each other. Sure. Because sometimes with strength coaches, it's hard to tell an athlete the truth when your income is based off it. Right, right. Um, no, but, that's a great point. But here with Lou, like brutal honesty is number one. Like we are very, very blunt and to the point. Like we're not rude and we're, we're always analytical, but if we think something's up, we're going to say it's up. Yeah. Um, and then like working with Matt, I, I, start, I understood the, the business side of, uh, professional fighting because you got to think when weight cuts go on they have to do all these media interviews they have to do these pre fight yeah. photos there's a lot of stuff that people don't see so you have to make sure you're in shape for that you, you got to be in shape for your weight cut and then you got to be able to bounce back and, and that's fight. the biggest uh, part for some people that's the biggest yeah. fight even outside of the fight well, the hardest part of it is putting the weight back on right uh, uh, like you can cut weight and like wrestlers can cut weight all like all that they're unbelievable at it but can you put it back on in the correct sequence so that they're uh, mentally uh, on point the next day. And um, like, and it, it's changed since I've been around it, but like you can only put on a certain amount of weight now and only take off a certain amount of weight. But um, it's it, like, that's an art. Like uh, George Lockhart has his whole system in place, which is very uh, informative. And I, I tell anyone just go out and read more about what he does, but there's a huge art to that aspect. But you have to be in shape to be able to cut weight. Now, back to John Jones for just a second. So doing all that cardio and trying to put on mass at the same time, a lot of people would say, isn't that working against each other? And how do you do that? How do you pull that off successfully? Look at the Jones family. <laughs> they're freaks in nature, all of them. Um, so like they're just genetically gifted at what they do. Uh, so I think you could give John Jones a BOSU ball and a protein shake, and he's still going to be a badass i it comes down to efficiency and it comes down to time under tension so once you're used to a, if anyone's ever gone up and down in weight once you get up to a certain weight at the start it'd be it's freaking hard you're going up and down stairs you're getting out of breath but once you keep doing um enough training to replace the oxygen that needed because mma is stop and start stop and start right hold quasi isometric isometric static dynamic so you've got all these different types of strengths and movements and once you're training that in tangent with your sport specific over a period of time, you can see what their strengths are. There's some people genetically don't have the muscle fiber that they can be endurance runners. Yeah. So you have to, as a coach, understand, oh, here's the strengths. We base the game plan off all these strengths. And then your opponent's game is like, oh, I think that might be a week. So that's where the, the head coach talking to him, you learn so much from them because they understand, like uh, Marcus Marinelli from Strong Style. Yes. He understands every aspect. He wants to know every aspect of his athletes. And it's super awesome to watch how he works 
like he holds pads, talks strat, everything. You're like, oh, they know their athletes inside and out. So whoever John Jones coaches are, they're going to have that. So they're going to be able to go, okay, here's your level of output you can put out. So he'll know from a pace point of view that if he goes at this, he'll be fine. But if he goes 100%, he knows he needs this amount of rest. So then that way he can clinch up, he can do these things. Like there's certain ways that you can tie in your conditioning to your sport specific performance. That now we sense. all know about wrestlers and cutting weight and there's definitely a, an age where you're past the point of zero returns. Like you used to be able to cut weight mm -hmm. and then you get to a certain age. What is that age? It's, it's, it's different of anybody and I'm no expert on this, but like from my experience with athletes, you only have a certain amount of weight cuts. You don't know what that number is. But I do know wrestlers because I've been doing it for so long. You say certain amount of weight cuts, cuts. meaning like, like with like physically, mentally and physically, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. Your body eventually gets to a state where like, look, dude, you're not cutting weight. Then it becomes like, uh, bad for your health. And that's where you see people that like, going up in weight. And then there's a ratio of how much water you can draw out of a body. And if you keep going over that ratio every time, your body eventually has to survive. It's like, hey, we're not doing this anymore. That's why you see. And, and then there used to be certain things you could take to cut weight and then the laws changed and then you have to play by the rules. So then, but, but by taking those agents, you quicken how many weight cuts you can do. Gotcha. Okay. So it's, okay. Uh, it's, I'm no expert in it, but, um, from just watching and working with these athletes, you're like, oh, there's like, you can't keep cutting from 170 to 140 all the time. Right. Right. Work. It just after a certain amount of time, your body gives out. So this segment, I could ask a million questions. Yep. And I know the people that are watching are saying the same thing. They're like, I have questions. So in the comment section below, or just feel free to DM us, weak things break. What are your questions? And in the next podcast, Tom and I will answer any questions that you guys have. Awesome.